Hello? Oh, cool. All right. So I know that I am between you guys in happy hour. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, so far, we've been talking about software. And, and we're still going to talk about software. But I want to talk to you about it taking, taking it to the next step, right? Building, building to the system level, all right? And, and the reason I want to talk to you about that is I've built lots of systems, and we've talked about it. Some of us have talked about it in the room. Um, I can get the software done, and then I can do it again, and I can do it again because the hardware is not done. So it doesn't really matter. And what happens is it just causes me rework because I keep having to update the software. Uh, we'll skip that. All right, so I'm gonna tell you first about some challenges. I'm gonna try to whiz right through, tell you about some challenges, and then tell you about some ideas that I think could maybe help these challenges. All right, and you can see them all here, but we'll deep dive into them. First thing is long lead times, all right? So with software, we're, we're having lower lead times, but if I have a supply chain issue with hardware, if I have to wait till I get the physical product, I still have very long lead times. Um, so we, we have that constraint. We have really expensive integration and test requirements. And one of the things that we do is because traditionally we've built using a waterfall, we don't buy those environments till the very end. I can't actually validate the system, right? And I can't convince anybody to invest in this equipment ahead of time to validate the system so that I can incrementally build because it's expensive. I have a lot of dependencies, so many dependencies, right? If I'm, if I'm trying to update a, a satellite constellation, there's so many things I need to consider. Risk management. It's bad enough in software. Once I started grabbing hardware in the supply chain, it was a whole nother deal, right? I have, and, and I'm talking specifically about space, but we're really saying this, this could happen for any cyber physical system, right? Because it's, somebody mentioned it earlier, software defined everything, right? So software defined systems, things that we can have from a GPS, solar interference, uh, frequency, signal degradation, jamming, spoofing, all the things, right? General Saltzman's number one priority this year is anti-jamming technology. An extensive attack surface. We thought it was amazing to link everything together, and I still do, but when we did that, we actually made it, we extended that attack surface exponentially, right? So beyond the software, there are so many places where I can hack into this. We have a lot of safety and reliability constraints. These also are things that we have to take into account. And it's typically, again, it could be software only, but really you'll find this with anything that is a cyber physical system for the most part. All right, here's just NASA standards. There's a whole bunch of them. Regulatory compliance hurdles. We have an amazing number. Um, the ones that I have, uh, you know, engaged in or, or worked on is a little bit of the ISO 27001. I've talked a lot to the vehicle companies on A-SPICE, right? So we have, and these regulatory requirements inherently are built around a waterfall approach. There's actually this really great pitch, uh, paper that talks about um, whether Agile and DevOps is at, you know, odds with uh, the European safety standards. So uh, a group of researchers went and they did a, an analysis and they found out of the 271 standards that Agile and DevOps was only at odds with 17 of them, which you can say, well, that's still scary. But when they looked a little bit further, in every single case that it was at odds, it's because that safety standard was evaluated at a phase gate. So inherently, the cycle is built around waterfall which is where that comes at odds. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about maybe some ideas to extend Agile and DevSecOps to large cyber physical systems. Um, I'm frequently told that Agile is just for software and even ChatGPT says it. I was so disappointed. It's like, really? 
Um, but, but I disagree, right? I think it's all about how you manage your work. And I recently also did uh, you know, an analysis of the top 10 scaling frameworks for Agile. Interestingly enough, there is an 88% overlap in principles and practices against every scaling framework. So as much as there's a religious war against all of them or between them, like they're all the same. Now the good news is, is each of them is validating each other, so that's cool. Um, my, my advisor, because I'm working on my dissertation, said, is that really, like, does that bring anything new to the community? I go, you should just listen to the religious wars. I go, I think it does. So in October of 2023, we published, uh, myself and Dr. Suzette Johnson, a book, and it's called Industrial DevOps. Now, it's kind of got an unfortunate title, and it's just because that's what we started calling um, the papers back in 2017. Um, because really, we leverage uh, bodies of knowledge from systems thinking, design thinking, systems engineering, agile, DevOps, lean, shift left, pretty much all of the tools in your toolbox in order to optimize the delivery of systems. So organizing around value. This is one of the largest problems both in the government as well as within internal organizations that I've seen, right? We've got program managers. They talk about things like lean startup and getting moving. We've got systems engineering, pretty much talking about things like systems thinking, design, talking about design thinking, hardware, rapid prototyping, right, all day long. Software, generally agile. Test, we're talking about shift left. And operations, you hear a lot about IDLE, or IT Infrastructure Library. Interesting thing is they're all trying to optimize the delivery of the system independently. And to make it even better, they all created their own language so we don't actually have to talk to each other while we optimize the delivery of the system. So that's not how that works, all right? <laughs> we have to do something about that. Um, multiple horizons of planning. So. Uh, Really extreme agilists will say, hey, we only do short-term planning. You know, Waterfall does long-term planning. I pretty much think that you need to link those two together and move from predictive planning to empirical planning, right? If I'm going to get to Mars in 2030, I still have to have a roadmap. I have to have a long-term plan. Now, here's where we make a mistake between having this type of plan and, let's say, an integrated master schedule. Here at each one of those time horizons, I have a feedback loop that allows me to use empirical data to further inform my future plan. Now I can tell you from 26 years at Lockheed Martin, they don't want me to inform my future plan. They want me to beat people to get back on the original plan that we made before we actually had any data. So here, yes, I need to have a multiple year execution plan if I want Artemis to get to Mars, but I actually need to have these feedback loops and use it to inform those plans, all right? If you've ever been on a program where somebody said, we're gonna do Agile, but I need to do all of the user stories for the next three years, don't do it. That's the wrong plan. And I only say this because I've listened to this three times. One of the things that we can do in order to extend Agile and DevSecOps to the cyber physical system is get the physical system into cyberspace, all right? So we really want to leverage things like simulators, emulators, digital shadows, which are really low fidelity twins, digital twins, 3D printing. Um, these technologies have reduced in cost and increased in availability over the last 10 years, which allows us to do things we couldn't do 10 years ago. So there's no reason not to extend this further, all right? And this allows me to make a lot of changes. I can iterate. I'm not gonna buy down everything, but I'm gonna find out a whole lot to buy down risk. And I can also reduce that test equipment, all right? So at least to get started. Remember I said software defined everything. So we've got the X-bomb, right? So I can secure everything as well. I 
I was doing research on this, there is a bomb for everything. The best one, though, is obviously the data bomb, which is thebomb.com. <laughs> My kids said that I am not allowed to say that, but I just thought it was awesome, so I did. <laughs> but there's a, there's a bomb for everything, right? I got a platform bomb, a data bomb, a machine learning bomb, an operations bomb, all the bombs. Yes, I need to know what is in my uh, product, whatever it is, and I need to know the provenance, how to validate it, et cetera. Architect for change and speed, not just in software, right? I have to do this in hardware as well. Uh, now, there's trade-offs for this, and if you've heard of Relativity Space, you'll notice that they actually went in the other direction. They did 3D printed their entire rocket, and it's not very modular, but that, that works, so I'm still looking at the trade-offs. However, in most cases, a modular architecture allows me to change a portion of the system without actually having to throw away everything, right? And then it's a lot faster, all right? So looking at how to do that. Iterating and managing queues. This is not new, right? We've been doing this since Lean, we've been doing this since Deming, even before Deming. Um, now, the one thing that I would tell you is a little bit different about product development versus manufacturing is in manufacturing, we want to eliminate all variability. You guys agree with that? We want to eliminate all variability. But in product development, we want to exploit good variability and get rid of bad variability. Now, that's really hard. So what I need to understand is I need to remove all the noise from the system. So putting things on a common cadence, iterating through allows me to do that, and it's a lot easier to pick out that, that variability, the, the different types. Cadence and synchronization. I'm not expecting that we're going to get to Mars overnight or in the next two weeks or anything like that. However, we need to move from minimum viable product to next viable product to next viable product. And we need to actually put together teams around that that are focused on that delivery of value. All right, and you can see here, I don't integrate every time, but I'm trying to integrate as much as I can. Continuous integration for hardware is just a little bit different, but again, it can be done. Actually, we just created a demo at um, the Software Engineering Institute that shows how to integrate and do a CI-CD pipeline for FPGAs. Now, I'm really pushing to try to get a CubeSat, which they won't let me have, but I'm trying, a, a CubeSat so that I can do CI-CD and update the CubeSat every, every single build, right? Whatever changes I need, update a sensor, change the color, whatever we want. But again, very similar to how we're doing it in software, except we're going to extend that to both the models and the system. Shifting left everything. So one of the things that I learned pretty early, even if I didn't start with, let's say, automated test, is um, I actually got a requirements for a, uh, an RFP probably about, I don't know, five, six years ago. And Internally, we had this spreadsheet, no magic, nothing amazing, but basically it looked at risk for requirements. In order to look at the risk, you had to identify how you would test it. Well, I had a whole bunch of very reasonable requirements for a particular missile until I laid out how I would test them. And it only took me a day or two, it was just a little extra work, um, during the proposal phase to find that 31% of my requirements weren't actually testable. I was like, oh, they look good, right? You know, it's, it's, it's uh, reliable, it's resilient, all kinds of great words, but by beginning with how I'm gonna test it, right, I've got the answer to the test question first. And, you know, McLaren for Formula One does a lot of this, right? They've got digital twins. They begin with how they're going to test it. They run the scenario over and over and over again. Um, also, a lot of good examples from NASCAR. And then that growth mindset. So this doesn't look like a growth mindset, but I can tell you that if I was to put anything or launch anything when I was at Lockheed and I thought I had a 50-50 shot, which is what Elon said on some cases, it wouldn't be launched, right? Here, 
instead of beating anybody up, he's like, oh, we had a rapid unscheduled disassembly. Um, got all the data we needed. We're OK. Um, this is definitely a growth mindset. His ability to force learning and get that fast for physical systems has reduced the cost to launch. It's reduced it so much that, you know, 10 years ago, or maybe 20, I would tell you about the launches that Lockheed was doing. Today, if I was still at Lockheed, I'd tell you about the number of launches I was piggybacking off of Elon's rockets, right? Because it's cheaper for me to use his than mine, because he learned faster. So this is the book. You can get a free chapter one if you want to take a, a picture of it um, and, and tell me what you think. I love feedback, so tell me all the things that are wrong. I guarantee that I missed a bunch of things. I'm not kidding. Really, go ahead. Tell me all the things that are wrong. Because I'm really interested and excited about delivering large-scale safety-critical cyber physical systems faster so that we don't just pace the threat, that maybe we can outpace the threat. And that's what I have. Any questions? I'm like, no, we're happy hour, Robin. <laughs> Go to it, Cam. Give me, he said he was going to give me the hard ones. So but not I, I think that perhaps maybe your users are more advanced than my users. I struggle to convince people that they should maintain parity between their development and their production environment. And that's just with software. Oh, yeah. And and what you're proposing here is is full scale high fidelity dig digital twins. I mean, that just feels like like a chasm. Like how ha ha how do you get people there, right? Because I can't get them to like have a working single sign on in their dev environment and then they everything breaks. So um, good question, well phrased. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I can tell you this. I had my first Agile program in 2002. And I've been frustrated every year since about how slow we go. But when I look back, we've gotten some things done. OK, that's a cheesy answer, but it's true. Uh, the other thing is really looking at how we build stuff. So did anybody see the, um, the Space Force's uh, little, I guess, uh, info sheet and they first came out, and in the back they put a um, they put a scenario, a vignette. So I go through the vignette, and this is when General Kreider was still um, in place, and I showed her, and I said, "So this looks really good until you get here, because what they did is they updated the system once they found out." And I go, "This wasn't the place to update. You should have updated the model that updated the digital twin that updated the system. You just created drift, and this only works for you one time. So I think order of operations with our, our, our folks is, is really important, right? Never fix something on the high side. Fix it on the low and push it up. Otherwise, you don't have parity. But it is all hygiene and discipline. And inherently, you've got some companies who are doing it and are outperforming the rest of us in spades. So that's the, that's the best I got, but we really have to look at that. Any other questions? So I, I know your, <clears throat> your work is primarily DOD, and this, I mean, it definitely applies in the, for the department. And I think thinking about the acquisition strategy in terms of not just how we acquire the individual system, but how we think about like systems. So if you're talking about um, a series of rockets, then we're, if we're able to upgrade that rocket over decades to be the best rocket, then you can reuse your models and your mocks and your simulated service and emulations and all those things. I think we, we tend to farm those out to multiple companies and change drastically what our design was or our concept for that. And so... I, while I, in principle, I'm in agreement, it's how do we get to a acquisition model that may support some of these things over long term instead of trying to stand up this infrastructure for individual systems? So commercial's done that too for us. Again, I'm not saying it's easy within the government, but we're talking about product line engineering. So my experience with Lockheed is for the longest time, right, we had a one-off bus. 
constantly. Everybody, even though this customer asked for something very similar to this customer, it was quite you know, just a little bit different. And, and honestly, most people don't actually say, what about this? This is going to do the same thing. Like they never, they take the exact one-off requirement. So my recommendation is really for the DOD, if they're going to own stuff, looking at product line engineering and saying, okay, this is my, my requirement for buses. And anything that has to do with this has to either be interoperable, right? You have to have some sort of um, way to connect to it and that we build upon it. It's only gonna make them better, it's just not how we've ever procured anything in the past. Um, that being said, I provided updates for DOD 5087, updates for DOD 5085 to, to skip Hawthorne. I don't know if anything's gonna come of it, but I keep trying. It, what I need is the guiding coalition for you guys to keep trying too. Anybody else? And, and if you don't have any, this is fine, because I totally get it. There are, oh, there's alcohol. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned that uh, the uh, guys from IT operation like uh, invented some IT uh, infrastructure library, which quite does not work in these scenarios. Can you give more information about what not works? Yep, you mentioned that it quite not works. They oh. did some internal <laughs> things. So it does work. It's the language that doesn't. So if I'm talking to software engineers, they don't even know anything about ITIL. If I'm talking to the ops folks, they don't know anything about how you did rapid prototyping. It's simply a nomenclature and language problem. Inherently, if you step back, right, if I abstract it up a layer, they're all trying to do the same thing reduce batch size, get fast feedback, right? standardize. So we just call it something different. So it's not that it doesn't work, it's that we need to step back and create some sort of a Rosetta Stone or common language so we're not talking past each other. Hmm? Do I have a solution for that? So on the programs that I worked, I am relentless on that Rosetta Stone. Right? I could tell you all about Agile and never ever tell you we're doing Agile um, because most of those principles, practices fall into a whole bunch of things that have evolved over time. So coming back to just developing that common language, if I'm working with a program manager and they've been PMP trained, I don't tell them about story point estimating. I tell them about Delphi planning. They had to use it to get their PMP. And so Delphi planning is story point estimating. And it's been around since the 40s. It's not something new. So begin with language people understand as opposed to, you know, we, we just keep fighting the language. Yep. All right. I think, I think I'm probably done. Is that right? But you can come talk to me anytime. I really appreciate you staying. I actually have some stickers if you guys are interested. All right, because I mean, stickers are important. Thanks. I know, right? <laughs>